A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Horror movies are not my thing. I'm just not a fan of gratuitous violence. I think when you've experienced real-life blood and gore, you don't need to see it glamorized on film. But since the name of this week's episode is the Freddy Krueger Killer, I needed to find out what made our subject so interested in this particular fictional serial killer that it earned him this nickname. In case you're not familiar with this movie character, Freddy Krueger is the villain of the horror franchise A Nightmare on Elm Street. He terrorizes teenagers in a small Ohio town with a glove made of knives. Sounds like your run-of-the-mill slasher film, right? But what makes Freddy more frightening is that he only attacks his victims when they are asleep, which means that their dreams are literally living nightmares. Hence, one of the more famous quotes from the movie, whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Freddy Krueger lives in a terrifying dream world where he is all powerful. It is only when he gets pulled into the real world that Freddy loses his powers and becomes vulnerable. And that may be the connection this week's killer, Daniel Gonzalez, had with Freddy Krueger. The 24-year-old British man had a long history of serious mental illness, and like Freddy, was vulnerable in the confines of the real world. Daniel's dream world was fed by the slasher films he spent hours binging. The world of horror was his playground. When he embarked on a terror-filled three-day killing spree, the entire south coast of England was gripped by fear. Although he wore a white hockey mask and wielded a knife just like the killer in Friday the 13th, the other horror franchise he loved, the press named Daniel after his favorite character. And for those horrific three days, the Freddy Krueger killer placed the residents of England in their own real-life horror movie. From Wondery and Treefort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche. I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed dozens of murderers, including serial killers, and the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. I want to give you a satisfying answer, so I'm diving deep into the mindsets of these criminals to give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is Daniel Gonzalez, the Freddy Krueger Killer. Around 9 a.m. on September 15, 2004, 24-year-old Daniel Gonzalez left the house he shared with his mother and her partner in Surrey, England. Armed with a kitchen knife and some clothes, he embarked on a three-day killing spree. In the nearby coastal town of Portsmouth, Daniel found his first victim. 61-year-old Peter King was walking in the park with his wife and dog 
when Daniel jumped into their path, he whipped out a steak knife and began stabbing Peter, who fought back with all his strength. When the two fell into some nearby bushes, Peter gained the upper hand and knocked Daniel's knife away. Daniel then abruptly stopped, stood up, and apologized. Sorry, he said. I'm a schizophrenic. I can't help it. Then he ran away. While Peter King survived the brutal attack, Daniel's second victim was not so fortunate. 73-year-old Marie Harding was walking to her home in West Sussex when Daniel Gonzalez attacked her. This time, he was more prepared. Wearing a white hockey mask and armed with a large knife he stole from a local hardware store. Daniel believed his first victim survived because his knife was too small. In a letter police later found, Daniel wrote, quote, I did my best for my first time, but the knife was too small. He would not make that mistake again. He slashed Marie's throat and stabbed her in the back. After stealing money from her purse, he left her there to die. After the murder, Daniel headed home and wrote in his diary. He described killing the elderly woman as a, quote, proper bloodbath. And he also said, it felt really, really good. One of the best things I've done in my life. I will be a serial killer. The next day, Daniel left home and traveled north to London, where he spent the day drinking and taking drugs. At some point that day, he stole two large kitchen knives from a local department store, which he would soon use on his next victims. Still on his bender, Daniel was drunkenly roaming the streets of North London in the early hours of September 17th, searching for more victims. At 5.30 in the morning, 46-year-old Kevin Malloy, a landlord walking home from a local pub, was attacked by Daniel from behind. When the victim asked his attacker what he was doing, Daniel replied, what do you think I'm doing? I'm killing you. Kevin Malloy died from stab wounds to his chest, stomach, and face. After that killing, Daniel continued on through North London. Around 7 a.m., Daniel climbed through a window of a home. In the process, he woke a married couple who were asleep in their upstairs bedroom. The husband went downstairs to investigate the noises he heard and found Daniel standing in the kitchen with a knife in his hand. Then Daniel attacked, stabbing and biting the man. The homeowner, however, fought back while his wife tried to help by hitting Daniel with her slippers. She then ran outside screaming, which prompted Daniel to run away. Now, back on the streets, Daniel found his way to the home of a retired pediatrician and his wife, a retired music teacher and charity worker. The elderly couple was finishing breakfast when Daniel reportedly rang their bell. When the man opened the door, Daniel stabbed him, and then the wife in the face, neck, and chest. While Daniel was still in the couple's house, a decorator came for a scheduled appointment and found the couple dead in the hallway. Daniel was standing near the bodies half naked. He looked like he had just showered. When he saw the decorator, Daniel pushed quickly past him, rushing out the door. Frightened and horrified, the decorator rushed out and called the police. 
By the time the police arrived at the scene of this double murder, Daniel was at the hospital under a fake name, getting stitches to multiple cuts on his hands. He said came from broken glass. Daniel then went to the tube station. He walked up to the window to buy a ticket and handed the agent a 20-pound note stained with blood. The agent alerted police who quickly arrived and arrested Daniel Gonzalez. In the three days before he was caught, he had murdered four people and hurt two others. And even though Daniel told police that voices were telling him to become Freddy Krueger, unlike his fictional idol, Daniel's murderous spree was random. He even said so himself later, as he told police after he was caught, quote, I had no idea who they were. I just wanted to kill someone. Daniel Gonzalez was born on June 21st, 1980, in the town of Woking in Surrey. His parents, Leslie Savage and Julian Gonzalez, separated when he was six years old. And even though Daniel stayed with his mother, he maintained a good relationship with his father. When he was 11, Daniel's mother applied for a scholarship to a private boarding school where she worked as a cleaner. Daniel was accepted and enrolled as a day student there. He excelled at chess, football, and theater. However, during this time, Daniel really struggled with academics. An educational psychologist at the school diagnosed him with dysgraphia, a learning disability and neurological disorder that impairs a person's ability to write. He was also diagnosed with dyspraxia, a condition that affects motor coordination. In children, it can make them seem accident prone. It can also affect their short-term memory and make it difficult for them to express their thoughts clearly. But Daniel's issues were not just learning differences. Daniel was expelled from school when he was 15 for bad behavior. Things like drawing offensive cartoons on a textbook and putting pins on a chair. Around this time, he began smoking marijuana. For Daniel, this appeared to be a gateway to other drugs. Police once found him with a powder that Daniel claimed was ketamine an anesthetic that produces hallucinations. Ketamine is known as a dissociative anesthetic, meaning the user feels a disconnection from their surroundings. Early research of ketamine revealed an overall profile in human subjects that was remarkably similar to schizophrenia. Daniel was in and out of different schools until dropping out completely, which happened to coincide with the time he committed his first crime, punching and biting the ear of a bus driver during a fight over the fair. Still a minor at 16, Daniel was not charged. His mother tried to get him help through their family doctor who recommended he get assessed by a social worker at a local children's center. This assessment led to a referral to a local drug program, but Daniel never received a psychiatric evaluation. And this, unfortunately, would become a pattern. Daniel had yet another brush with the law in the spring of 1997, when after a few days working at a local bank, a job his mother got him, he was arrested for shoplifting. This was the last straw for his mother, and she made the difficult decision to place him in foster care with a local couple. 
Daniel's foster placement did not go well. He continued to steal, vandalize, and take drugs. Reportedly, he used LSD over 200 times. We covered the effects of LSD in our episode on Richard Trenton Chase. LSD can trigger hallucinations, but these would not turn a normal person into a killer detached from reality. However, if someone has a pre-existing condition, such as a serious mental illness, like schizophrenia, it can definitely exacerbate the symptoms. For Daniel, just like Richard Chase, it brought out the worst in him. In addition to LSD, Daniel also used cocaine, ecstasy, and ketamine. His drug counselor said that Daniel was demonstrating paranoid behavior. He thought people were talking about him and that the TV was talking to him. The term that's used for that is ideas of reference. Their idea when they hear or see something is that it's referring only to them. Basically, they make connections out of everything and they think or believe the significance of the coincidences or random events revolves around them. For example, watching TV and a commercial says, you need to buy this today. They will go to a phone and buy it. They think the person is commanding them to do it. That is an idea of reference, and it is part of the diagnostic criteria for diagnosing such mental disorders as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. When he was 17, Daniel was placed on a two-year probation order that required drug counseling. It was during this time that Daniel was finally evaluated by psychiatrists. In his first assessment in December of 97, Daniel was prescribed thioridazine, an antipsychotic. The doctor who prescribed it warned that there is a risk that if he continues taking drugs, he might develop a drug-induced psychosis. Within Daniel's case file, it was noted that thioridazine could either have been used to prevent this kind of episode or to ease non-psychotic symptoms of recreational drug use. Thioridazine is a first-generation antipsychotic, and when I was a clinical psychiatric nurse in the 70s, we used that a lot. In fact, it was the only antipsychotic available at the time. It can take up to a week or so to help a psychotic's thinking clear up. But there's a big problem with this medication. The side effects are gruesome. And as such, most patients don't want to take the medication. Daniel was finally on the medication, though, and able to return to school. But in February of 98, he punched a window And that was the incident that got him placed into a psychiatric unit for the first time. And that was for a three-week stay. A report from the consulting psychiatrist there revealed that she thought Daniel suffered from, quote, prolonged drug-induced psychotic illness. In other words, in her opinion, he had taken so many drugs that hurt his brain they made him psychotic. She didn't go any further than that, but she disagreed with the decision to discharge him. Upon his release, Daniel went back to live with his foster family, where his troubles with local police continued. When Daniel visited his birth mother, she reported hearing him, at times, talk loudly to himself at night. Let me tell you what that's all about. Here's what's going on psychiatrically. When someone is hearing voices, of course, the voices are in their head, but they don't understand that. The voices seem real. And the voice may say, 
I think you are a horrible, horrible person, and I think you should die. And if you hear that voice, you may respond, I don't think I should die. I think I'm a good person. But the only thing Daniel's mother heard was his response. I don't think I should die. I think I'm a good person. It is a sign that the individual is psychotic. And what that tells me is he either wasn't taking his medicine or he wasn't taking enough of his medicine. When he turned 18, he moved out of his foster family's home and started living with a new foster caregiver. Daniel was discharged from outpatient care in July of 1988. Why? Because he didn't want their help for his drug and alcohol problem. The psychiatrist who discharged him wrote in his file that she didn't see the point of him coming as he is not going to cooperate with any treatment. Only thing we can do is keep an eye on him. After he was discharged, representatives from different social service agencies met and decided that Daniel was at very high risk for violence towards others and at risk for suicide. They determined he might never be able to live independently. In another psychiatric report from September 23, 1998, a different doctor said Daniel was, quote, probably psychotic, but with sufficient insight and control over himself to be able to make quite rational judgments about himself and the future. So there you have it, two opposing views about the most serious mental illness known to mankind. That psychiatrist concluded that Daniel likely had a personality disorder and cited his heavy usage of LSD and ketamine as to why he was in a state of mild psychosis at the time. Yet, five days later, Daniel was taken by police to a security psychiatric hospital after striking himself with a metal saucepan and threatening his caregiver and the officers. He was admitted to the hospital, and his behavior that day was described as like a wild animal in a cage. It was there Daniel was finally given a diagnosis. Continuous paranoid schizophrenia. There are a few types of schizophrenia, and paranoid is the worst one. Now, we've talked before about the fact that the term paranoid schizophrenia is no longer used. The American Psychological Association declared it obsolete back in 2013. Instead, the diagnosis today would be schizophrenia with a paranoid subtype. According to the DSM, in order to be diagnosed with schizophrenia, the patient must be experiencing at least two of the five main symptoms. And those symptoms are, one, delusions. What's a delusion? It's a false belief, and no amount of evidence can dissuade a person from believing the delusion. Hallucinations, that would be hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there, touching and smelling or tasting things that are not there. Disorganized, incoherent speaking. Disorganized or unusual movements, such as being catatonic, which would be not moving at all, or moving abruptly or very strangely. And lastly, negative symptoms, which refers to a decrease in certain behaviors, such as a lack of emotion in facial expressions, a lack of hand gestures, or speaking in a flat voice. So two out of those five criteria need to be met for that diagnosis of being schizophrenic. The symptoms have to go on for at least a month, and the effects need to last for six months. There also has to be a social or occupational dysfunction, meaning it's disrupting the person's relationship and their ability to work. 
So, what do I think? Daniel was definitely schizophrenic. He was clearly suffering from delusions. One of the main symptoms which drove him to commit impulsive and violent acts. Daniel thought the TV was talking to him and told people he was hearing voices. He reportedly named them Katrina, Misha, Melinda, and Jenny Bean. I interacted with schizophrenics in a clinical setting for 10 years before I became an FBI agent. And in all that time, I never had a patient suffering from schizophrenia that told me they had names for the voices they heard. Most schizophrenic individuals never commit a violent crime. About 98% of them don't. But the crimes they do commit are usually disorganized and delusional, and they make headlines. In March of 1999, Daniel was thought to be stable enough to move to an unsecured mental health facility. And he was officially released as an outpatient by mid-April of that year. The psychiatrist in charge of Daniel did not believe he was schizophrenic. Here we go again. Instead, he described Daniel's symptoms as, he heard occasional voices or that kind of spontaneous, aggressive little outburst in his head, which he was trying his best to control. However, it's important to note that when the doctor said that, Daniel was on antipsychotic injections. So of course he appeared to be in control of his illness. After Daniel's release, his family thought a change of scenery would help him readjust. So he spent the summer with his father in Spain and then went back to living with his mother and her partner that fall. In December of 1999, Daniel's psychiatrist added a condition to his injections. He had to stop taking cannabis and other illicit drugs entirely. Instead, Daniel chose to stop taking the injections but he remained on an oral antipsychotic. He was also reportedly still hearing voices and self-medicating with street drugs. It was around this time that his mother kicked him out and Daniel became homeless. This pattern would continue for the next few years while his mental health care became inconsistent and nearly non-existent. And what happened to Daniel is very common here in America. It is very difficult for families to live with someone who is actively hallucinating. And so they frequently kick them out and they end up homeless. Approximately 50% of the homeless population in America is either severely mentally ill or intractably addicted to substances. As he approached his 20th birthday, Daniel was arrested again for burglary and street robbery and given another two-year prison sentence. He served out a year of his sentence at a young offender's institution and was then released on probation. A doctor overseeing Daniel reported that he observed no current mental health red flags And it was his opinion that Daniel was exaggerating his symptoms to try to avoid going back to adult prison. Several psychiatrists overseeing him during these few years agreed. They did not believe Daniel suffered from schizophrenia or other mental illnesses. Wow, I don't need to tell you, that was obviously a mistake. By the time Daniel was assessed again in January of 2004, he told that psychiatrist he had been off his meds for two years because of the side effects. And the physician, after reading previous notes, decided he could not detect any symptoms of mental illness. 
a later investigation into Daniel's care noted the diagnosis of schizophrenia he received earlier did not stick and, quote, never shaped his care in the way it should have. When Daniel was 22, the police took him to a hospital after they responded to an unspecified incident at his home. Daniel told them he felt unwell and that he could no longer live there. However, he was not admitted despite concerns from hospital staff. What's striking to me is how many doctors and other practitioners were involved in Daniel's life. He saw mental health professionals 58 times between 1998 and 2003, and not one of them could agree on any course of action or even a diagnosis. But one of them did say, quote, drug-induced psychosis, which is interesting to me because the symptoms of drug-induced psychosis, delusions and hallucinations, are also symptoms of schizophrenia. What's different is that with drug-induced psychosis, the symptoms go away when the drug wears off. With schizophrenia, they do not. We don't really know how long Daniel was ever off street drugs. His symptoms spanned many years. But I think he experienced the worst of both worlds, drug-induced psychosis on top of his existing schizophrenia. And this was a recipe for disaster. During his incarceration after the murder spree, Daniel told a psychiatrist that right before he committed these killings, he attended a rave where he took crystal meth. It was this doctor's opinion that something happened in September 2004, quote, to tip this man over. And he wondered if that something might be crystal meth. The doctor noted its association with violent behavior and that users with mental illnesses could find their conditions worsened while using it. He thought that Daniel's history of schizophrenia, combined with the huge rush of dopamine from crystal meth, might have triggered Daniel's killing spree. Crystal meth is a crystalline form of the stimulant methamphetamine. It is highly addictive and produces a huge surge of dopamine, more than alcohol, tobacco, or even cocaine. And while a cocaine high might last an hour or two, a meth high can go up to 12 hours. But it also causes a reduction in blood flow to the brain's prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for making decisions. It's the executive functioning part of our brain. So it impairs judgment and is linked to a variety of complications, including psychiatric side effects, such as increased aggression, risk-taking, paranoia, insomnia, and hallucinations. The same doctor who suspected crystal meth prompted the killing spree also noted that Daniel, quote, always had ideas of killing people. He wanted to do something horrendous. He wanted to kill people like Freddy Krueger. But he never had any plans to act on those until some other factor entered the picture that dramatically changed his behavior and resulted in what Daniel described to him as a dreamlike state. We also know from letters Daniel wrote later in prison that part of the social scene at raves involved listening to a kind of club music called doomcore, a form of hardcore techno dance music that usually has slower paced beats. It samples screaming and industrial noises and is also known as darkcore, deathcore, or demoncore. Now, listening to hardcore techno music 
playing video games or watching horror movies is not going to turn you into a serial killer. But since Daniel was someone who kept copies of a magazine called Freddy Krueger's Nightmares, and he was someone who also thought his TV was talking to him, who knows what he might have thought the demon core music was saying to him? I think it is important to point out something that happened the summer before his rampage. Daniel's father offered to host him in Spain again. But while there, he noticed Daniel was struggling mentally and wanted him to get treatment. So Daniel wrote his family doctor in England a letter asking for help. He said he suffered from schizophrenia and he wanted to be admitted to a hospital. He wrote, please, please help me. This is very urgent. I really, really do need medical help to find the correct environment and the correct medication. But Daniel never sent the letter from Spain. His mother found and read it when her son returned home, and she shared it with the doctor. Daniel was seen in early 2004 as an outpatient, but not admitted despite his requests. Daniel began acting out in new ways. He would punch himself in the face until he gave himself a black eye and he tried to break his nose by throwing himself down a staircase. Just two days before his killing spree, Daniel ran naked and screaming through the streets of his hometown in Surrey. His mother's partner took a car and searched for Daniel, but couldn't find him. When he got home, he discovered Daniel pacing in their kitchen and talking in a very strange voice. Concerned, he immediately went to the local police for help. And he told them Daniel was a paranoid schizophrenic who was not taking his medication. However, the police did not intervene or even come to the family's home on that day or the next. Daniel's mother wrote to social services, quote, does my son have to commit a murder to get help? And then, two days later, on September 15th, Daniel Gonzalez did just that. After Daniel's arrest, prison staff wore riot gear around him, even to take him to the bathroom. He began talking about killing again, either himself or someone else. After biting his arm hard enough to require a blood transfusion, Daniel was moved to a high-security psychiatric hospital. It was there Daniel told a psychiatrist that he believed he would be, quote, out in eight to 10 years. But his violent streak continued in the hospital. He randomly punched and lunged at the staff and even attacked his mother and grandmother when they visited. Eventually, Daniel tried again to bite himself to death. So he was placed into what is known as arm's length observation. That means he was never more than an arm's length away from a hospital staff member at all times. He was even forbidden from sleeping with his arms under his blanket. But somehow, it happened again. He bit his arm, severed an artery, and bled out beneath the covers until the hospital staff noticed and intervened. At the trial, Daniel pleaded guilty to manslaughter, not murder. The defense argued that Daniel was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic who had voices in his head, 
who had been denied proper care from hospitals and social services. But the prosecution disagreed and countered that Daniel had only been, quote, temporarily psychotic due to his personality disorder and extreme drug use. Another theory out there is that Daniel staged his defense, that he wrote diary entries to later support his insanity defense, that he lied about his symptoms to avoid consequences, and that by apologizing to his first victim, saying, I'm a schizophrenic, he was manipulating his own disease. The jury heard Daniel's words to the police right after the murders. Quote, I just thought about doing it, man. What would it be like just to be maybe Freddy Krueger or something like that, just for one day? Hearing these words helped the jury side with the prosecution's argument that Daniel Gonzalez was simply bored and frustrated with existence. The prosecution argued Daniel was a psychopath and drug addict, and that the combination of the two drove him to commit his crimes. The jury agreed and took only 50 minutes to come back with a guilty verdict. On March 17, 2006, Daniel was sentenced to six life sentences for his four murders and two attempted murders. Don't get me wrong, I think that Daniel Gonzalez belonged away from society for the rest of his life, but not in a prison, in a psychiatric facility. However, given his history with psychiatrists and being able to fool them, that could have backfired. But neither would happen. Because on August 9, 2007, after his three failed suicide attempts, Daniel Gonzalez, the Freddy Krueger killer, died in his cell after slashing himself in the wrist with the sharp edges of a broken CD case. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Story research and additional writing by Ann Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Senior audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With additional research and writing by Rebecca Shane Kula and Anne Liu. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Brandon Clark, Lindsay Whistler, Colin Modell, and Jada Williams are production assistants. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Joaquin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marsha Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. 